various pressures that uh, we are confronted with. And so here we are living this life and living in this world. And we are trying to find some way of coping. Yeah. Find some way of existing and being successful amidst our problems and amidst our frustrations. And so as, as, as we go forward, we ought to understand and remember and rejoice in the fact that uh, Jesus can overcome anything that you may face in your life. Relationship issues, financial issues, whatever the case may be, he can overcome it. And I'm going to tell you why that's good news. It's good news because we try to find solutions in this world, but we really can't find them. Why? Because they don't exist. The only answer, the only resolve, the only solution is in Christ. That was a good place for an amen. Uh, it, it, Jesus says this. He says, I know that the world, I'm paraphrasing, he says, I know that the world beats you up. I know that the world um, gives you, um, you know, uh, presents you a raw deal. I, I, I know that sometimes life um, hits you in the gut and knocks the air out of you, if you will. He says, but you ain't really got a trip about this world. He says, because I've overcome the world and everything in it. That's really good news to me because as I face challenges in life, sometimes I get overwhelmed. Sometimes there's a tendency to become anxious. Sometimes there's a, ten a tendency to become frustrated to the point that I don't know if I'm going to make it. And maybe I'm speaking with someone here today. Maybe you've gotten to the point where you don't know if you're going to make it. Maybe you've gotten to the point where you have thought about just checking out. You said, really, there's no resolve. I don't know how to deal with how to cope. So maybe I'll just take matters into my own hands. And there are countless individuals who have done just that. They thought, well, since I can't find my answer in money, I can't find my answer in relationships, since I can't find my sense of peace and my sense of resolve in the things that this world has to offer, maybe I'll, the easiest thing, the best thing is for me to just check out of this thing called life. To get off of this merry-go-round. You take matters into your own hands, and many people have done just that, and they've taken their life. I fell to understand that suicide is, uh, is, is, is a permanent solution, if you will. Uh, you know, you, you can't undo it. To, it's a permanent solution to temporary problems. One thing that I'm happy to announce is that trouble don't last Always. <laughs> it, it don't last always. I know storms come, but guess what? Storms go. Just yesterday, it was cold outside. The, the, it was rainy outside, but guess what? It didn't rain forever. It stopped at some point. And today, we got a little bit of sun, a little bit of warmth. Amen. Trouble don't last always. I stopped by on my way to heaven to tell somebody, I know you're going through right now, but guess what? Trouble don't last always. I know you're frustrated right now. I know your money is funny, your change is strange, and your credit just don't get it. But guess what? Trouble don't last always. You can make it. I promise you, you can make it. Yes, you can if you just hold on to God and change him. Why? Because he has and can overcome everything. Let the church say everything. Everything. Let me see. Uh, if you were to do an etymological study of the word everything, if you were to look at all the various languages of the world, if you were to search Google and Bing and look up the word everything, you know what you would discover? Is that everything in all the languages of the world, everything in all of the internet uh, search engines uh, that you can come up with, everything means everything. <laughs> it means everything. That means, that means there's no thing that he is unable to uh, overcome and, and there's nothing, nothing that he cannot conquer. God can do it. I promise you, he can. Amen. Yes, he can. Amen. And so as we enter into this uh, resurrection season and as we are reminded of the awesomeness of God and the uh, great uh, wondrous works of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus, I hope that we leave here today knowing that we are overcomers in Christ. But my brothers and my sisters, it requires us to be mindful of the fact that we can and we must rise up. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we must rise up. You got to rise up because if you sit and wallow in your situation, you end up dying in your situation. 
And why die when he died that we might have life? Preach Pastor Sanders. I am. I think they look for something else. I don't know. I mean, hey, listen. The truth of the matter is, is that the, the victory is ours because he has given us the victory, amen, in his uh, conquering death. All right, I know, amen. These, praise God. But these, <laughs> amen. Hallelujah. They, they, I'll, all right, y'all. The devil, the devil will try to distract the worship experience by using any and everything, even bees and wasps. Amen. She didn't know. She said, What did man hit me? <laughs> What is going on in church? The man just attacked me. He was trying to kill the baby. Amen. He didn't want you to get stung. And here comes another one. Y'all don't, don't, let the, don't let the enemy wow. Amen. Don't let the enemy distract you from the message. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on. Amen. I'm going to be like Jesus and turn everything into an illustration and a teaching moment. Just like the bees sometimes have you afraid and frightened to the fact that they have you running and have you, uh, you know, getting all excited, what have you. We do like he just did. We just hit the devil, amen, and knock him down and crush him. <laughs> amen. Just smash the devil. I know the devil is trying to sting you in your life. I know the devil is trying to, amen, attack you, but you just knock the devil down. You step on the devil, amen. And as LL PJ say, you squash him like a jelly bean. Amen. All right. Now let me see if I can get back to where I was in the message. Amen. So as I was saying, what was I saying? Amen. As I was saying, as we are living life and trying to deal with the various pressures and the vicissitude uh, that we encounter, we understand, my brothers and my sisters, that we can rise up. Amen. We can rise above any situation because of the power in Jesus and because of the power of Jesus. I've got a witness in you all today. So when you look at today's text, it's very interesting and very appropriate for today. Amen. As we look at the fact that Jesus took a, a hopeless situation and he introduced and spoke hope into that hopeless situation. As a matter of fact, there was a dead man. And God gave life to the dead man. If I can just pause parenthetically, that right there, my brothers and my sisters, ought to be a sense of encouragement to know that even when life gets us to the point where there seems to be deadness and desperateness and destitution, that God says, I even have overcome that. And he did it in the life of a man by the name of Lazarus. That's in the first text that I read to you in John 11. But in the text that I read to you in Matthew, it says, and Jesus himself overcame death because when he, his physical man, had died, uh, the Bible says, uh, amen, that when they went looking for the dead man, Jesus, they couldn't find him. Why? Because even death couldn't hold him. And it says, why looking for the living amongst the dead? He is not here. He has risen just as he said he would all my brothers and my sisters that's what Easter is all about that's what resurrection season and resurrection Sunday is all about it's about the fact that he has risen just as he said he would that death couldn't even hold him oh death where is thy sting death thought it had Jesus out for the count I can imagine in a very sinister way Satan was in uh, in his uh, you know in, 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 his, in his lazy boy you know because he he feels oh, I can relax now once, once once the Bible tells you know told us about the sacrifice of Christ he hung up on the cross and the Bible says and he breathed in his last and gave up the ghost and he hung his head and died I can imagine that there was a party going on in hell that Satan thought finally I've overcome God. Finally, I've beaten God. Finally, I have won. And I can imagine he was walking around peacock proud at the death of God. And so as Satan was walking around, thinking he had uh, it going on because uh, Christ had died and the sun refused to shine. 
all Friday afternoon, they turning up in hell. Friday evening, turn. Saturday morning, they still turning up. Afternoon and evening, they turn up, but all of a sudden, something happened between 12 midnight on Saturday evening, between 12.01 Sunday morning, and the moments and the hours thereafter, something happened, so while they were turning up, they automatically, their attention was turned to something else. Because there was a rumbling that took place. There was an earthquake, as it took, uh, if you will. All of a sudden, that rock that was there blocking the tomb, a man had been rolled away, had been moved, and he who was yet dead had now risen from the dead. He who they thought was dead and out of the count now was alive with all power in his hand. My brothers and my sisters, that's what Easter is all about. That's what Resurrection Sunday is all about. That though he died on Friday, Sunday, he rose again. And because he rose, we can rise as well. And I'm not talking about the ultimate resurrection of mankind and the resurrection of the dead. I'm talking about even resurrection from your dead and dying situation. No matter what you're going through, guess what? You can rise above that. Why? Because Christ has conquered it all. There's no thing, nothing that we cannot do. Paul reminds us that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul reminds us by saying, watch this, y'all. He says that um, no, there's no weapon formed against us that shall prosper. Amen. Thank you. Uh, Paul reminds us that we are more than, than conquerors through Christ Jesus. So quit letting life um, tell you that you're a victim. When in actuality, you are a victor. Amen. You're victorious. Victory is my name. As we look at today's text, in particular the text in John, we see a man by the name of Lazarus. Now, Lazarus is not just some ordinary joke. Not just some random cat. This happens to be a friend of Jesus. He was a friend of Christ. Pun intended. As this friend of Christ found himself in a situation that was above his head. He got him sick. And his sickness was even to the point of death. And his sisters, who also were Jesus' friend, Mary and Martha, they, they called on Jesus because they knew that if there was hope, any hope uh, for their brother, there was going to be in Jesus. Like it was Paul's parent as you're dealing with your situation, whatever your situation is. If there's any hope, any resolve in your situation, it's going to be in and through and from Jesus. Amen. And because we are those of us who have placed our faith and trust in He and He alone, not only are we children of the Most High, not only are we disciples, but guess what? We are friends of Christ. That ought to really make you shout because because of sin, we were at enmity with Christ. Do you know what that means? That really means that we were enemies of Christ, enemies of God because of our sins. But because of what Jesus did on Calvary, it made us no longer enemies, but made us friends of Christ. Yes, Lord. And so as friends of Christ, I mean, in the true sense of friend, I know some of y'all, uh, you have a warped understanding of what it means to be friends. Because we live in a Facebook age. So you think that you are, uh, you know, got it going on because you've got hundreds or thousands of friends. Baby, let me tell you something. I don't need really to burst your bubble, but those folk ain't friends. No, they, they ain't friends. Uh, uh, Jesus says, Great love have no man, therefore a friend to lay down his life for his brother. I mean, a friend, I use that word li- uh, uh, very carefully and cautiously. I don't call everybody a friend. Got a whole lot of associates, but I don't call everybody a friend because it really means something when you have established true and genuine friendship. And so to be friends with Christ means there's relationship with Christ. And to have relationship with Christ, that means my brothers and my sisters, we are able to tap into Christ. And Christ lives inside of us. And by living inside of us, he works through us. And because he works through us, there's nothing that can overcome us, that we are overcome by. We're friends of Christ. So as a friend of Christ, we rejoice in the fact and knowing that if we're going to get any type of solution or resolve in the sense of hope, it's going to come through Jesus Christ. 
And since he's our friend, we know he's going to look out for us. He has our best interest at heart, right? Friends have the best interest of one another. And so, of course, if last time, Jesus is going to look out for his friend. So they call on Jesus. But Jesus was off doing ministry uh, in a nearby, nearby town. And, and while he was there, instead of rushing to Lazarus' aid, he stayed where he was a couple of days longer. And in doing so, Lazarus' situation had gone from bad to worse. Come here, let me ask you a question. What do you do when your situation goes from bad to worse? And to make matters worse, you're a child of God. You're a disciple of Christ. You're a friend of Christ. Surely he should have come and he should have intervened in a human predicament and rescued you and delivered you. But no, he, he, he took his sweet time, as it were. Maybe you're frustrated, you're angry. If the truth be told, you wouldn't tell nobody that. You wouldn't stand up and admit that and testify and say, yes, church, I'm angry and upset with God. Most people wouldn't do that. No, 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 no. But on the only inside, they're dealing with their own personal frustration and anger and, and, and sense of a lack of confidence and lack of faith because God did not show up and God did not step in. And so you're doubting and questioning him. And here he is. Lazarus' sisters were upset. They had an attitude. Yeah, they did. How do I know they had an attitude? Well, just read the Bible. In the previous verses, it says, when Jesus finally showed up, when he finally stepped on the scene, when his sisters, when Lazarus' sisters heard about it, the Bible says his sisters ran to Jesus. And as she ran to Jesus, and she saw Jesus standing there, if I can use my Tony Sanders translation and illustration and characterize this thing for a moment, she put her hand on her sister's hip and put her finger in his face and said, had you been here, my brother Lazarus would not have died. If, if, if you could just kind of uh, really just tap into the pathos of this, of, of, of this exchange. And, and she's standing there, I imagine, with some degree of, of, of desperation and some degree of frustration and irritation because Jesus, her friend, Jesus, Lazarus' friend, her brother Lazarus, is now dead and Jesus showed up too late. Had you been here on time, my situation would have gotten this bad. Maybe I'm speaking to someone here today. Jesus, in your mind, showed up too late. I was waiting on you. I was needing you. I was counting on you yesterday. But here you are today. And you, you said, you're God, right? So if you're God, you could have come. You could have stopped this from happening. But the worst case scenario occurred in my life. My only son has been killed and is dead now. Had you been here just moments earlier, you could have stopped him from dying. My, my, my relationship was on the brink of divorce, but now it actually has gotten to the point where we are no longer even talking to one another. We went from sleeping in separate beds to now living and abiding in separate homes. <sighs> where were you at, Jesus? I hear people testifying all the time, he's an on-time God. Yes, he is. But you weren't on time for me. Why'd you do it for him, but you didn't do it for me? I, I, I don't understand. I mean, I, I read my Bible like everyone else, and, and, I, and I just call upon the story of, of Jairus. And Jairus came to you, and Jairus says, My daughter's at the point of death. I need you to come. And as they were on their way to Jairus' house, all of a sudden this woman steps in and she hijacks a blessing, as it were, because she had an issue um, that she was bleeding and hemorrhaging for 12 long years. And she stepped in and she detained the, 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 the Christ. She distracted the Christ. And she uh, ended up getting a blessing and in the of hurting the blessing, I end up experiencing a curse. Because my daughter died. And I imagine the job just thought it was too late now. As a matter of fact, his homeboys came and said, no need to detain the master any longer. <laughs> Your daughter is dead. She was at the point of death. No, 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 now she is dead. Let, let the master go on his way. What do you do when you stand around and you're trusting God? You're walking with him. He was walking with Christ. Christ was on his way to his house. 
The situation got worse. Maybe I'm speaking to someone here today. You're doing the best you can. You've got a relationship with Christ. You're walking with Christ. You're listening to Christ. You're talking with Christ. You serve in ministry. You give your money. You read your Bible. You pray. You fast. You do all these things. But yet, your situation goes from bad to worse. What do you do? And you got and to make it even worse than that, you got to watch everybody else get blessed around you. While folk are testifying in church about, I had me a house built from ground up. You're struggling because you're being evicted from the shack you live in. While people are riding around me in front of them, and got wheels that turn while they stop. <laughs> you got four mismatched tires <laughs> with no hubcaps on them. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so here you are living life. Well, everyone else is balling out of control, but you're begging. Oh, come on, y'all. Come on. Fill me on today, if you will, just for a moment. Let's just be real. Let's just be honest. So, 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 life seems unfair, and life seems frustrating, and all of this, and, 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 and Jesus, you, you took your time. So, how have you been here? My brother would still be alive. Jesus looked at this woman, and he said to this woman, uh, in a real sense way, in a real sense, um, when Jesus looked, as a matter of fact, let me just read it to you. When Mary had come, when Jesus saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Why says, therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. Can I just pause for and let you know that we serve a God who feels us and feels our pain and can relate to the human predicament. We, we don't serve a God that is void of feeling. But he feels just like we feel. He groans when we groan. He moans when we moan. And, 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 and here he is. He's groaning himself. Watch this. He came to the tomb. It was a cave. And a stone lay against it. If I can just for a very brief moment just kind of give you a dress. Um, and paint the, 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 the portrait, the backdrop for the context. We're talking about a, a tomb in first century Mediterranean culture. And so, 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 so these tombs, these graves are very different than ours. Um, we're not talking about a six, digging six feet uh, under and, and laying a body in a casket and so on and so forth. No, no, we're talking about bodies being laid in caves. And in these caves, stones are rolled to cover the hole and, or the entrance into the cave. And so, uh, and it is his seal. But Jesus comes upon this sealed cave, this tomb, um, uh, uh, and, and, and he looks at the tomb. And see, some of us, we look at that tomb, and what we see is desperation. What we see is defeat. I mean, there's really no options here. The man is dead, and he's buried. And there is a boulder. There's a rock. I'm not talking about some little bit of rock that you just put on out of the way. It takes a couple of y'all. It takes a few of y'all, somebody's amen, to move a rock such as this. And so it's sealed. There's nothing that can be done at this point. Oh, how many of you are there in life where your situation seems to be to the point of exhaustion? It, you've exhausted all options and, and, and you don't see any resolve, any solution whatsoever. And the tomb, as it were, the, the rock, as it were, was the tomb was sealed and the rock has been rolled to cover it up. There's nothing to do now. You're stuck like Chuck without a truck. Amen. And so here, here, here it is. That's the scene. Jesus walks up on the scene and this is what he encounters. But wait a minute. I told you that Jesus can come overcome anything, right? There was no obstacle, no barrier, no challenge, no situation that he is unable to um, demonstrate victory in. So even though when you see what you see, you see hopelessness, when Christ sees what you see, he sees hope spoken into your situation. Amen. So I said, it was a cave and a stone lay against it. But Jesus in verse 39 said, take away a stone. Yes. Oh my God, that right there was your cue to shout. And you missed it. Y'all better wake up. I'm almost done. Wake up because he says, roll away the stone. Take away, remove the stone. But my, some of us are scratching our heads saying, why move the stone? Come on. Because first of all, the stone, stone is a symbol. It's a representation that all hope is lost. The man is buried. He's dead. He's buried. And the tomb is sealed. So, Opening up the 
the tomb is not going to change anything. Because the stone is there because the man has been buried. And the man has been buried because the man is dead. And the man is dead because the man was sick. And when the man got sick, Jesus didn't do anything about it then. So what makes you think he's going to do something about it now? Why should we worry ourselves and, and trouble ourselves with rolling away the stone? Oh, that's where you are. Why? Why go to church anymore? Why read my Bible anymore? Why, why, why trust in God anymore? I was trusting in God and going to church and reading my Bible before my situation died. And he didn't do nothing then, so why should I continue to do what I'm doing in hope and expectation that it's going to change? It didn't change then, and it definitely ain't going to change now. Why should I waste my time and roll away the stone when I hear the voice of Jesus simply saying this? Come on, roll away the stone. I stop on my way to heaven and tell somebody, roll away the stone. Yeah. Matter of fact, you ought to turn to your neighbor and tell, and tell your neighbor, roll away the stone. I, I, I know the relationship seems to be dead, but roll away the stone. I know uh, that your financial trouble seems, um, you know, that you just can't get out of it. You're, 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 you're stuck. Roll away the stone. I know that the doctor's walking away shaking his head, and there's nothing else they can do. Roll away the stone. Jesus tells you to roll away the stone. You ought to just simply roll away the stone. Yeah. Jesus says, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time, he stinketh. My God. Oh, man, I'm speaking to someone here today. Your situation stinks. Yeah, yeah it does. Literally and figuratively. This stinks. How many of y'all have said this stinks? Yeah. Man, it seems like Speaking to the women, every, every, every man I see the hookup went seems to be a zero instead of a hero. This speaks. <laughs> I thought that we were in love and would be together to death do us part, but instead of, uh, you know, us being together and spending the rest of our lives together, he found a new model and upgraded. This, this, this speaks. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't promise me all these big dreams and now I've got this child and or children and he's gone off to live his life and don't even pay child support. Uh -uh. This stinks. Come on, come on. He presented himself as a prince and, um, you know, and, and, and what's the prince? Shining armor? Prince Charming? You know, riding in on the black horse. But he ended up being a frog. <laughs> and a dog. And yeah, and, and so I, this stinks. I thought I hit the jackpot. Jackpot. No, no, this, this thing. Hey, sisters, can, I, can, can any of y'all relate? Amen. 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 Hey, let me know I'm preaching to somebody. Here. This is this stinks. Now I'm a single parent. Now with one baby, two babies, three, four, five babies, and five different fathers. No, this, this, this stinks. Maybe I'm speaking to someone who you had aspirations as a young child growing up, and you thought you were going to be this and be that, and you had your whole life planned out, but life happened. And instead of you becoming this and or that, you found yourself living beneath your potential. You found yourself working in a dead-end job. You found yourself living in a situation where really it just, this, this stinks. This is not what I signed up for. I can go on and on. So I allow you to, to I allow you to paint your own picture. I allow you to tell your own story. But bottom line is, you found yourself in a situation where it stinks and it's rotten and there's no hope and it's dead. You don't know what else to do. So you tell Jesus, there ain't no sense in doing this because it's dead. And it has been dead for four days. Now you take that and don't look at it literally. Look at it from the from the from the um, most broadest sense. It's gotten to the point where listen, bodies at that time, after four days, I mean rigor mortis has begun to set in. I mean, what do you do when your body is starting to um, uh, deteriorate? Rigor mortis is set in. So I mean he stinks. He's, he's starting to, you know, decay and all that. We don't want to see him like that. Your situation has rigor mortis has set in. So what, what, what can we do now? <coughs> I've already been evicted. <laughs> what, what are we going to do now? Already, I already, I had a disconnect notice. Now it's disconnected. And they don't want just the past balance. Now they want a deposit. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I didn't have a past balance. Who makes you think I got a deposit? I think that's something that's funny. When you find yourself in a situation like that, they won't more than what you had and you didn't have what you they were asking for in the first place. <laughs> so anyway, four days. He's thinking now. 
And he's been dead for four days. Uh, but Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of the Lord? Yes, sir. I just want to speak in some situations. And even though the stone is covering the tomb, and even though your situation is dead and it stinketh, Jesus says to you, just believe. Amen. That's the same thing he said to Lazarus. I mean, uh, to Jairus. When they told him, your daughter is dead now. He says, don't fear. Only believe. If you believe, I promise you, you will see the glory of the Lord. The worst thing you can stop doing is, is stop, stop doing is stop believing. And stop trusting. And stop having faith. Don't stop having faith. Don't stop believing. Don't stop trusting. Keep on trusting the Lord. We sing our songs, but do we really believe it? I will trust in the Lord. And we put wind on until I die. That's what the songs say. But you trust until you see no more hope. <laughs> you ought to trust. And you ought to believe. And you ought to hold on to your faith. Regardless of what your situation says to you. And he says, Did I not say to you that you would believe, uh, if you believe, you would see the glory of the Lord? And watch this. Then they took away the stone. Y'all, I really don't have time to milk this thing like I want to. There's so much I want to say, but I know your attention span is very short. Uh, you know, uh, so, uh, our attention span is only as long as our back end can withstand. Amen. And some of y'all, um, we have long past that. Amen. So you ready for Red to go on and chunk this thing off because you got a ham in the crock pot? <laughs> you ready to go on and have your Easter ham? Amen. Make sure you invite the pastor over to bless the food. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. But watch this. So, 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 it, it, here they are. Uh, it, it really excites me because it says, he said, roll away the stone. And the next verse, it says, they roll away the stone. Right, right, right. Y'all, that was an indication that they were listening. That was an indication that they were still trusting. They were listening and they were leaning on the Lord. And all my brothers and my sisters, you got to keep on listening and you got to keep on leaning. Because if you listen and if you lean, I promise you, you'll liberate. Pray for Pastor Sanders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just you gotta keep on listening. And he says, move away the stone, roll away the stone, remove it away. Whatever it is, he says, do just do it. Okay, I just added five more minutes to the sermon because that was a good place for an amen. You just looked at me. Amen. If you can't say amen, look amen. So let me give you this quick illustration as I try to make my last point stick. Remember when Jesus was at the wedding? At the wedding at King of Galilee, amen. And, uh, and and they ran out of wine. What a bad thing to do when you run out of wine, amen. They had a wedding, they ran out of wine. You know, turn up in, turn out. You know, that's what we need on the wine. Everybody had to go home. No, Jesus' mother said, Jesus, they run out of wine. He said, What does this have to do with me? She turns to him and says, Whatever he says, do, just do it. Call my brothers and my sisters. And what Jesus told them to do, he says, Go get them water pots. Fill them up with water and take them to the head table. Right. That don't make sense. They asked for wine. You said fill them up with water. Water ain't wine. You want them to fill these pots up with water and take water to the head table when they need wine. It don't make sense. Nevertheless, whatever he says do, just do it. I'm speaking to someone in your situation. It don't make sense what he said to do. Uh, here it is. You're struggling as it is. And you are trying to make ends meet. But yet the word says, sow a seed into the ministry. God I can't sow a seed. I ain't got money to pay my bills. I ain't got money to do this. Sow a seed in the ministry. That does not make sense. And because it don't make sense to you, and therefore you, you refuse to obey them, you hold on to that seed, and therefore the seed does not produce because a seed will not do what the seed is supposed to do unless you sacrifice the seed and bury the seed in the ground and then the seed will produce a harvest. I'm speaking to someone here on today. As long as you hold on to your seed, all you have is a seed. But when you learn to sacrifice and sow your seed, you will now have a harvest. Preach, Pastor Sanders. I promise you I am. So watch this. It don't make sense. But if he says do it, do it. So when they start walking with the water pots, by the time they got from the filling station right. to the head table, yes. the water in the pots had turned to wine. And when the head folk dipped in to get their wine and 
And what they thought was water, they pulled it out, filled up their little glass, and said, my God. <laughs> They said in most of these things, they say uh, they, they, they use all the best wine up at the beginning right. and then give you the cheap stuff, boom, for them at the end. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? But no, not at this way. They give you the good stuff at the end. Right. Somehow, some way, Jesus did a miraculous work and turned ordinary water into fine wine. And they didn't have time to age. They didn't need to age. They didn't need to sit. They didn't need to be court. It was the finest of the fine. Why? Because Jesus had touched the water. I'm talking to some of you today. If you just give him your water, I promise you, he'll produce fine wine in your life. Don't make sense to do it. So here they are. They rolled away the tomb. That showed that they knew that Jesus was going to do something miraculous. So they listen and you leave, you may just learn why he liberates. <laughs> so they moved away the tomb. And when they moved away the tomb, uh, I imagine this. Talk about mid, 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 Mediterranean. Uh, I had the privilege of, of being in the uh, Middle East in, in Israel uh, for three months, y'all, and it gets hot, hot. Turn to them and say, hot, hot. You know, that, that's hotter than hot. I mean, it's 120, 130 degrees. Uh, you understand? It's hot and stale. So you can imagine in a tomb where dead bodies are. It's stinky. And so it's stinky up in there. They move the tomb. But the steam is now starting to permeate into the general air. Mm, watch this. And, 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 and Jesus says, so we told them to move away the stone. And they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you. And so on and so forth. What Jesus did was he prayed to the Lord. He prayed to the Father. And then after he prayed to the Father, he said these words. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Yes. What he was really saying is, rise up. <laughs> He's dead. He's stayed. He's been dead for four days. But rise up. Yes, sir. He's got God speaking to you today. He's speaking to your situation. Sit down somewhere, boy. He's speaking to your situation. And he's saying, rise up. Get up. I know you were out for the count. I know you thought that life had you beat. But get up. I know, I, I know that there seems to be a sense of hopelessness, but rise up. Hold your head up. Because Jesus is speaking life into death. So he says, rise up. He says, Lazarus, come forth. Now, I can't, no one can actually ever preach this text without going old school Baptist for a moment. Because the old Baptist preacher has to put his commentary in by saying, he called Lazarus by name. Because had he just simply said, rise, then everybody in there would have gotten up. But he was speaking directly to Rob Lazarus. So he says, Lazarus, rise up. But if I can now just speak in a contemporary way, he's speaking to every last one of us. He's saying, he's saying to you, rise up. Aubrey, rise up. Brother Bill, rise up. Darius, rise up. Travis, rise up. Brandy, rise up. Specifically and individually. Now you woke up because he called your name. Amen. Some of y'all, that was a real life illustration. He was telling you to wake up. Amen. And you're going to sleep on the preacher. Wake up! Walk, rise up! And come forth. And all of a sudden, I could have called this text Dead Man Walking. <laughs> because all of a sudden, now you got this dead man walking. That right there was a sight in and of itself. To see the dead man walking as this dead man was walking. The dead man still looked like a dead man. How do I know that? Because he was still wrapped yes. in linen. He was still covered in his grave yes. clothes. But Jesus says it's not good enough for you just to rise up. He says, I need for you now to step up. Yes. And not only step up, watch this, I need you to clean up. All yes. oh, my brothers and my sisters, he has the power to not only rise you up um, and, to, and to clean you up and cause you to step up. Listen, he says... Watch, watch what he says. Let me read to you. It's right here. I don't, I don't want you to ever think I'm making any of it up. He says, the eagle who was wrapped in the dead clothes, the grave clothes, he said to him, loose him and let him go. Three things in the mouth. He says, let him come, let him loose, and let him go. I'm done now, y'all. Y'all might as well go home and shift yourself and get yourself ready because we're about to get up out of here. This is what he says in a real sense when he says, Lazarus, come forth. When he says, rise up, what he's saying is, let him come. 
Christ is speaking to you right here and right now today. Whosoever will, let him come. No matter what your situation is, he says, come on. I, 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 well, Pastor, you don't know what my life consists of. You don't know what I, what I used to do. You don't know what I'm doing right now. As a matter of fact, I came here from somewhere I had no business being. Christ says, I ain't tripping on that. I know because I saw you there. Rise up. Come on. Lord, I still smell like marijuana from the night before. Come on. I'm hungover from last night's activity. Come, 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 come on. He says, come forth. Just as you are, let him come. Whosoever will, let him come. But God, I'm caught up in, in, in sinfulness, and I'm caught up in debauchery, and I'm caught up in devilish activity. He says, come on. Come on as you are. I'm so glad to know that, 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 that God accepts you as is. Anyone who, who, who knows anything about fishing, you don't go and catch fish who are already clean. You catch fish in the environment in which they are in, and once you catch them, then you clean them. And he says, I don't care about how bad you stink, reeking like loud. <laughs> Come on. I know you got sweet wine on your breath. Come on. As you are. So let him come, but not only let him come, he says in a real sense, let him loose. Yes, yes. He was wrapping his grave clothes. Take them grave, grave clothes off. I know you are caught up in your situation, but when God speaks to your situation, liberation is available. He's simply saying, He's going to clean you up. You, you, you need the rest of God. Because some folks say, well, we'll preach, I, I, I will when, when I get my life right. If you can get your life right, you wouldn't need Christ. It's because you can't get your life right that you need him in the first place. So let him come. Let him loose the things that's held you bound, the things that's held you back. He says, let him loose. Be free from that. But then he goes on to say, and let him go. Call my brother and my sister. I'm done. I promise you I am. But when Jesus says, let him come and let him loose and let him go, what he's saying is no longer will you and shall you be bound by the thing that has bound you. And because I am setting you free, watch this, whoever the Son sets free is free indeed. So since he's freed you, you now can go. Let him go. Go in liberty. Go in victory. Go and, and, and live your life with your head up and go and walk as a victor and not a victor. Let him go. Go reach your full potential and let him go so he can be a witness because y'all now Lazarus was a living witness and a testimony as to who God is and what God can do. That's right. So when people see you who were dead and stanky and caught up, when people now see you, they say, there must be a God. Yes, sir. There must be a God. Because he, he or she don't stand no more. Yes. They're, 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 they're free from their grave clothes. Yes. And now they're living their lives. Have, the best thing you can see is someone who's living a changed life. Yes. And guess what? The best way to change your life is to change your life. Yes. So that's my message to you today. Rise up. Rise up from your dead and your stinking situation. Because he lives, we live. When they went looking at the tomb for Jesus, they were asked the question, why look you for the living amongst the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Yes. That's what the Resurrection Sunday speaks volumes. It speaks to us and says, because he lives, we too live. Amen. Because he has risen, we too can rise up.